All right, so it's about 11.03. We will get started with our opening keynote session. So just to welcome everyone to the seventh annual Global Health Students and Young Professionals Summit. My name is Sakshi. I am the vice chair for this year's planning committee, and I'm tuning in today from Hamilton, Ontario. So I just want to start off this opening session with some keynote um, some opening remarks from our chairs, Hunster and Priscilla. So I'll pass it on to them to get us started. Hi, everyone. My name is Hunster, and I'm calling in from Toronto. Hi, everyone. My name is Priscilla Pangan, and I'm tuning in today from Ottawa, Ontario, unceded, unsurrendered territory of, of the Algonquin Nation. So we will begin this event by acknowledging that we are meeting on Indigenous land that has been inhabited by Indigenous peoples from the beginning. As settlers and guests of this land, we're grateful for the opportunity to work and live here. And we thank all the generations of people who have taken care of this land for thousands of years. As I'm currently calling in from Toronto, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional land of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. Today, this meeting place is still home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we're grateful for the opportunity to work on this land. While we all meet today on a virtual platform through Zoom, please take a moment to acknowledge the importance of the land which we each call home. We will now be placing a link in the chat. We highly encourage you to understand where you're situated and reflect on the history of the land that you're living on. We do this to reaffirm our commitment and responsibility in improving relationships between nations, to strengthen our own understanding of local Indigenous peoples and their cultures, and to work towards reconciliation alongside Indigenous communities. Thanks, Hunster. And um, just confirming now is the time to go into some housekeeping items. Perfect. So yeah, just to go over a, a quick run of show for the day, um, please remember as you move throughout sessions um, to stay on mute. And um, within this webinar, you can also direct any questions or concerns to the Q&A function, which is accessible in the bottom, uh, at the Zoom panel at the bottom of your screen. Um, you'll note that we also have closed captioning available in English and uh, live French interpretation during the keynote sessions. Um, so that'll be bookending today, um, this opening keynote and the closing keynote, as well as the careers panel right after lunch. Uh, for French interpretation, you can access this through the bottom bar again on Zoom uh, by clicking on interpretation and selecting French. And then you should be able to hear um, audio there. Uh, for ease of listening, we also recommend um, to select the option to uh, mute original audio. Um, as a team, we strive to make uh, GH SIPs as inclusive and safe a place as possible. And uh, for that reason, we request all attendees review our code of conduct, um, which will also be available at this time at the link um, in a link in the chat. And we hope that you feel comfortable um, to reach out, with, uh, reach out to us with any concerns you might have. Um, also, as well as any tech difficulties you might have, you can reach out to us at ghsips at gmail.com and we'll, be, uh, we'll, we'll try our best to make sure we, we uh, get you a response and the support that you need. Um, we also encourage you to make use of the closed Facebook group throughout the day. Um, that's really where we're going to be connecting. You know, despite the virtual circumstances, and we give a shout out to those who have already started to do so. Um, so we'll have more of that planned uh, throughout the day. So be sure to tune in there. Link will also be in the chat. And uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Sakshi again. Awesome. So now before we get started, I just want to give you guys an overview of GHSIPS itself. So 
The Global Health Students and Young Professional Summit is situated within the Canadian Coalition for Global Health Research, CCGHR, and the Canadian Society for International Health, CSIH, coinciding with the Canadian Conference on Global Health. So GH SIPS itself is a student-led organization that's comprised of students and young professionals coming together from a diverse range of backgrounds. And this year in particular, um, we were pleased to have had a phenomenal team of 14 hardworking individuals from all around Canada to present to you our first ever virtual summit. So this year registration was also phenomenal in that we received an astounding number of 686 registrants situated from all around the world. And the theme for this year's summit, as you can see on the slide, is ideas to impact ideas to impact global health and action. So this theme seeks to find practical, equitable solutions to health problems that exist in the world. As global health students and young professionals, we have an important part to play in breaking down privilege and power dynamics at the core of global health inequities and bringing principles of social inclusion, justice and solidarity in putting global health in action. And so finally, we'd like to recognize the wonderful partners and sponsors that have helped to make this year's summit possible. So with that, I would like to um, present our opening keynote speaker, Dr. Pai. Just to give you a little brief bio on Dr. Pai, Dr. Madhu Pai did his medical training and community uh, medicine residency in Vellore, India, where he completed his PhD in epidemiology at UC Berkeley and a postdoc fellowship at the UCSF. So Dr. Pai's research is mainly focused on improving the diagnosis and treatment of tuberculosis, especially in high burden countries like India and South Africa. His research is supported by grant funding from the Gates Foundation, Grand Challenges Canada, and Canadian Institutes of Health Research. With more than 300 publications, Dr. Pai is a recipient of the Union Scientific Prize, the Chanchlani Global Health Research Award, and David Johnston Faculty and Staff Award. He is a member of the Royal Society of Canada and a fellow of the Canadian Academy of Health Sciences. So now without further ado, I will pass it on to Dr. Pai to begin his presentation. And just a reminder throughout the session, you can submit any questions that you have for Dr. Pai in our Q&A um, button on Zoom. So that is located at the bottom bar and we will get into a question session at the end of his presentation. Thank you very much, Sakshi, and to all of you for this uh, privilege uh, to address you um, at this conference. Can you see my slides okay? Yep, looks all good, Dr. Pai. Perfect, thank you. Um, Sakshi, please give me a shout out when I am about 25 minutes in. Yep, sounds good. Thank you. Uh, so um, it's, a, it's a real pleasure to, to meet all of you virtually. And I know this is a really challenged time for the whole world, uh, especially young people. Um, my own um, students are having a challenging time with uh, online education, not being able to see each other. It's been a very challenging time for everyone, and I acknowledge that. Um, and I think um, we should also ask whether any good can come out of all of this mess that we are in globally. Can we use this crisis in some way to reimagine a better world um, in the, in the post-pandemic period, whenever that might um, happen? So before I uh, say a little bit about what I've been uh, learning and thinking about is I want to um, acknowledge my own privilege. Um, I was born in a small town in, uh, in India and you can see this is the actual hospital uh, where I was born. It's called the Christian Medical College. I ended up doing my medical residency training in the same institution where I was born. Uh, I did a lot of community health work uh, in villages uh, when I was training. And I remember a lot of, uh, you know, American, Canadian, uh, European, uh, white students coming and spending a few weeks with us in, in South India and then going home and publishing papers while none of us could publish anything. I, I remember feeling unhappy about the fact that uh, local expertise uh, didn't seem to be greatly valued um, as, as opposed to uh, visitors from abroad. Um, I don't know, you know, what made me uncomfortable then. Much later on, I kind of understand what that was. 
and here I am, you know, today I, I am the director, associate director of the TB Center. I was until recently the director of the McGill Global Health Programs. I've helped send hundreds of students to low and middle income countries, Canadian students to do global health. So in some ways, I, I do worry about this conflict or tension that I have uh, internally, um, because at one point I saw global health on the other side. Now I'm seeing global health from this side. Um, and it's a tension that I have to live with. And it's a conflict that I constantly worry about all the time. But to not acknowledge that I am in a privileged position today um, would, would be um, not fair to, to where I came from. I also acknowledge that as a male, I have a whole bunch of other privileges that I have not earned. So with that uh, acknowledgement, um, I will share some of my uh, thoughts with you on, on, on what, uh, what is wrong with global health and what we need to do in terms of uh, fixing things. Um, you know, even in my own Global Health 101 course that I teach at McGill, uh, which I've been teaching for the last six years now, I can see an evolution in my own um, ways of how I think can communicate. I think there is a blue pill version to global health, which is the naive version of global health. And that version will kind of look something like this. Um, it'll say that global health does have a colonial past, but it will probably say that global health today is in a much more equitable place than it was in the past, that today we've come a long way. Today we truly have bi-directional reciprocal partnerships and that we care a lot about equity. Um, now, some of this is true, but I would argue that we should dig deeper and ask, you know, what is the red pill version of global health? Um, if we swallowed the red pill, what would the reality look like? And it is this red pill version of global health that I've been increasingly writing about and talking about in many, uh, many platforms. Um, part of it is my own awakening and my own um, small research that I've done with my team members to kind of uncover some of the deep rooted problems and imbalances in global health. And again, I let me be very clear here. I'm not the first one to point out these problems. Uh, I'm among probably the last ones to point out this problem. People have been writing about this for years now. Um, it's just that I have woken up relatively late uh, and, and have been more vocal about it in the past few years than I have in the past. So please take a look at any time you wish to some of the um, articles that I've been writing in this series uh, on Forbes. Um, but in a sense, I want to use some data. And to me, as an epidemiologist, data is very powerful. And any time I've presented this data anywhere, it has left a very powerful impression on the minds of people. So with that spirit, I want to actually share some information with you, uh, which are factual. And then we can argue how to interpret the data. So if you ask the simple question, who sets the agenda in global health? Um, we could look at the Global Health 5050 report this year. Here are uh, about nearly 200 uh, global health organizations around the world. And a simple question was asked, where are they headquartered? Turns out that a gigantic share of them are headquartered in Europe uh, and the rest pretty much are headquartered in North America. And headquarters is where agendas are set, budgets are finalized and the action pretty much happens. So, um, so if you ask me what is the summary of this particular slide, I would say uh, global health organizations are pretty much all based in the global north. And who runs these organizations? That's the next slide. So again, the same report showed that for every 20 global health organization directors, CEOs, or board chairs, 14 are men, 17 are from high income countries, only three are nationals of low and middle income countries. The report actually went even further than this. If you ask me who is the most powerful, influential, privileged person in all of global health, the answer comes back clearly. It's a male, it's an older male, it's an older white male, it's an older white male who probably went to Harvard, because that's what the data show. 
and it's an older white male who went to Harvard and who now lives in America or, or UK. That is what the most powerful privileged person in global health today looks like. That's the person calling shots in global health. So um, I was talking to Joanne Liu um, not too long ago and she said, Madhu, global health is an aristocracy. I said, wow. Uh, and that's the, who's the global health aristocrat? That's the profile of the person that I just spoke about. Who is least represented in global health? Woman of color from a low and middle income country is the least represented person in all of global health. So the pattern of privileges that we may have earned in colonial times still dominates global health. And that's a recurring theme in this particular conversation. Next, who finances global health? In other words, who, who, who controls the purse strings? We all know the, the old adage, right? You know, follow the money trail. Well, that's what you do, follow the money trail. And the global burden of disease data clearly shows that global health financing is driven by the richest countries in the world, United States being right at the top. That's why US is a dominant, dominant, dominant player in global health. And that's why the influence of US and US-based organization is um, incredible in the arena of global health. If US doesn't like that idea, in all likelihood it's dead, uh, followed by UK, Gates Foundation, Canada, France, Germany, Australia, so on and so forth. So the richest countries in the world and the richest philanthropies that are located in these countries pretty much call the shots on where the money is spent, how it should be spent, who gets to spend it, and how exactly it should be spent. So the United States says, no, you cannot um, offer abortions. Well, that's the Mexico global gag rule right there in action. Or the United States says only abstinence, um, not contraception. Well, that's a policy that is dictated from somebody in Washington, DC. Who publishes in global health? Well, the whole, whole slew of papers have come out of this. And if I were to kind of give you a summary headline of all of this research, then the paper at the top, the headline of that paper tells it all, stuck in the middle. Authors from low and middle income country where the research is often done are stuck in the middle, if at all they are on the paper. They're not, usually not the first author, they're usually not the senior authors, they are somewhere in the middle, if at all they make it on the paper. That's how imbalanced publishing in global health is. People like us in the highest income countries pretty much corner the pole positions of publishing. Well, who's editing? Well, this is a small study that my team did, and we found that global health editorial boards dominated by people from the high income countries, they're dominated by men in the highest income countries and others have confirmed the same kind of findings. So again, who is overrepresented as editorial board uh, members? Uh, predominantly white folks from high income countries, mostly men, least represented is women, women of color from the low and middle income countries. Where are global health degrees offered? Some of you are in global health degree programs, right? So we did a small study, we published it this year and here are the results. Global health master's degrees are primarily offered in North America and Europe. It almost looks like the same graphic I showed you on where the headquarters of global health organizations are. Um, and then how much tuition fee do these master's degrees in global health charge? Well, if you want to get one in the United States, you'll have to shell out something like 66,000 US dollars if you are an international student. In um, uh, Europe, it would cost you about 20,000 US dollars if you wanted to get a master's degree in global health. We could not find data on exactly who is taking these degree programs, but with this kind of a tuition fee structure, uh, we didn't even count living expenses or anything else, just pure tuition alone. When your total cost of a master's degree in global health can go well over $100,000, then you already know it's the most privileged people and mostly students from high income countries who are benefiting from these master's degrees in global health. And where the global health training needs are and where global health degrees are offered and who is taking them, seems like there's a massive dissonance between the two. They are not aligned at this point. 
and uh, organization after organization after organization in the last few months, especially in the context of Black Lives Matter, have pointed out deep-rooted problems within global health agency. White saviorism, white supremacy, and racism seems to be a huge part of the DNA of these organizations. In my field, for example, uh, the Stop TV, Stop TV Partnership, um, uh, there was an article in New York Times about racism at Stop TV Partnership. United Nations has been accused of racism. WHO was accused of um, uh, sexual harassment uh, in DR, DRC Congo during this Ebola outbreak. Médecins Sans Frontières has been called out for white uh, supremacy within the organization. Uh, women Deliver, the women's organization, uh, where white women have been found to be racist towards women of color. And this is a recurring theme in pretty much every other global health organization, which then should tell us that something is fundamentally wrong with how global health even internally behaves towards its own employees. And schools of public health are not far behind. This is a, a whole um, campaign by London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine showing that global uh, public health schools have deep-rooted colonial legacies. I mean, tropical medicine itself is a colonial era uh, term, right? And the fact that there are many, many European schools that it's still called tropical medicine tells us something about how uh, closely they are tied to colonial uh, ways of doing things. The faculty composition of the top 15 public health schools is white at the top, black, Asian, and minority ethnic at the bottom. Very few schools of public health are led by women, women of color, or people from low and middle income countries. And just so we don't think colonialism is a past issue, I offer you two very contemporary uh, topics for discussion. One that hit, hits us very close to us home here in Canada, the poor state of indigenous um, people in Canada in terms of their health. The fact that medical colonialism is still widespread in Canada, the fact that people are still being mistreated in our hospitals as we speak. In the last month or so, multiple episodes have come to light. And the fact that we have tuberculosis rates in the Inuit people that's 300 times higher than the rest of Canada, or the fact that Black uh, African Americans have some of the worst health outcomes even today, years after slavery ended, or that COVID is much more likely to kill Black African Americans than white Africans and uh, white Americans is a stunning indictment that colonialism is still alive and thriving even in the richest countries in the world. So I want to now share the key takeaways from what I've just shown you using data that every single aspect of global health is dominated by individuals and institutions and funders in the highest income countries. If you wind the clock back at 100 years or 200 years ago, that is colonialism writ large, which is still operating today. But then there are groups which are obviously talking about decolonizing global health. There are groups talking about white supremacy, about racism, about white saviorism, about patriarchy, about the lack of women in global health. I have a hunch that we are all approaching the same elephant, but from different angles. I'm not sure what that elephant is, but I'm starting to suspect that it is the deep, deep rooted desire to accumulate power, wealth, and influence that drives all of these manifestations. Racism is, a, is an invention of white people who wanted to remain in power and who wanted to deliberately take power away from black and colored people. Same thing holds power and privilege are very deeply linked uh, that is what Sakshi told us at the start, which I 100% agree with. And I think colonialism was also about extracting resources and wealth and enslaving uh, people in poorer countries. I think if we don't understand how deeply imbalanced the power structures and global health are, we will not be able to dismantle the power structures. So to me, the growing call to decolonize global health or to tackle racism and global health merely um, some facets of a much more complicated uh, problem that I'm outlining. Um, and I think we need to start understanding where it all converges and, and, and what we need to do to change it. Because if we just 
tried to attempt to change one part of it and leave the rest untouched, we may not quite succeed. For example, if you say women are missing in global health and you advocated for more women, but then if you end up in an organization like Women Deliver, which is led by white women who were then racist to women of color, we've still not fundamentally addressed the problem. We need to think about it a lot more holistically than what we've been doing so far. So in terms of what could we do about this deep, deep power imbalance, um, I've been thinking more along the lines of, uh, so, so clearly who should lean in into global health? Obviously, women should lean in because they are underrepresented. Folks in, in the global south should take a bigger uh, leadership role in global health. So they all need to find a way to lean in. But I keep wondering, is there any room for them to lean in? Because I find that every aspect of global health, as I've shown you with data, is dominated by men, dominated by white men, and dominated by white men in the highest income countries. They have pretty much cornered the entire real estate in global health. So how do you lean in when there is that big gorilla in the room occupying the space? There's no point in just saying uh, women should lean in or folks in Global South should lean in. So I am starting to understand or at least argue for myself that powerful established older men in global health should actively lean out. They have to get out of the room, pass the mic, create space, so that others who are way more um, worthy of that spot should take up that spot. Now, this requires dramatic rethink of how we do things. Um, you know, two days ago, there was a panel in the Women uh, Leaders in Global Health Conference. It was the only uh, manual, uh, and I was one among the men on the panel, and we were asked what we were doing in terms of leaning out. And I gave concrete examples of how I'm trying to lean out in my own, uh, in my own uh, career. I think overall, I would argue that those of us who are privileged and working in high income countries in global health should stop seeing ourselves as the leaders and instead see ourselves as allies. That our job is to not take up all the real estate, to not be leading, not be the first starters, not have all the grant money, not have be the ones presenting on all global health platforms. Our job is to step away, step back and be more of a supporter and enabler and an ally, not as a leader. So allyship is, a, I think, a huge part and learning how to be an effective ally in global health is a, is a, is a project that I think we should all embark upon. Now, what is this COVID going to do? So I wrote a piece where I interviewed a lot of people uh, from all parts of the world. Can any good come out of uh, this COVID crisis? And I think I, I noticed, and as did many others, that there are some positive elements of this uh, pandemic, that we all see the value of global health. We all see global solidarity is critical, that we all see health is wealth. We know public health is valuable. And we also can see self-reliance among low and middle income countries who are probably doing a better job of handling this pandemic than the highest income countries. But I can see huge number of negative things coming our way, which I wanna share with you, because I think as young people, interested in global health, you need to be ahead of this and almost think ahead on what you wanna be doing to counter some of the negative fallouts of this pandemic. I think the first big negative fallout I can see is a complete failure of global governance. Right now, nobody knows who the hell is giving direction in terms of uh, uh, on how we're gonna end this pandemic. Every country has retracted back into its nationalistic, isolationistic, xenophobic um, base level and, and global solidarity is under deep, deep attack right now. It's very hard to now say why we should care about another country, given that we are all looking inwards right now. And, and, and US withdrawing from WHO or attacking WHO is one manifestation of this way of thinking. Secondly, when countries become deeply inward looking, one of the first things that they will cut is international aid or development assistance. It's already happened. UK has cut it, US has cut it, and I'm worried that Canada, which doesn't spend a lot, by the way, for our GDP, might also follow that same pathway if we don't do something to advocate for it, right? 
And even as countries are being pushed into poverty because of this pandemic and the need for development assistance is actually going up, I fear that that's when high income countries will find a way to cut and, and reduce the amount of international development assistance. And, and vaccine nationalism is so rampant and it is merely, I think, a symptom of nationalism of all sorts, right? Building walls, banning travel, uh, cutting refugee programs, cutting immigration programs, open hostility towards uh, Chinese people and calling the virus a Chinese virus or a Wuhan virus are all manifestations of the same underlying um, extreme uh, nationalism, populism, and isolationism. And that just shows up in, in holding vaccines and buying up vaccines. And, and Canada is no, not exempt from this kind of behavior either. And even as we speak, the pandemic has got a devastating impact on every single aspect of global health. Malaria mortality is expected to double. TB deaths are expected to go up by uh, almost 40, uh, 400,000 um, just in the next few years. I mean, this is just absolutely devastating. Uh, 15 million unintended pregnancy, millions of kids have missed their basic vaccination, and we are uh, uh, entering the deepest recession since World War II. How will low and middle income countries without deep pockets survive this level of devastation and carnage on every aspect of global health? And, and this COVID and its collateral damage to me is just the first tsunami that's hitting us. The next tsunami will come with this recession. And we know poverty is one of the strongest determinants of a resurgence of a whole bunch of problems. Where there's poverty, there's TB. Where there's poverty, there will be domestic violence. There will be um, uh, women who will not get to deliver in hospitals. There will be babies who die of pneumonia. This is a, a massive issue that requires us to think ahead. And then there is a bigger tsunami behind that, one of climate crisis. Now, the question that we have to ask is if the world isn't united in this pandemic, what makes us think that the world would be united in dealing with the mess, next big climate crisis that comes our way? Sorry, this, Dr. Pai, just yes. to interrupt, you're at the 25 mark. Perfect. Um, I want to leave, leave enough time for questions as well. So this uh, picture uh, is, is so sad because, I mean, it hurts me because this was my home. Um, this was the San Francisco Bay Area, and all of you have seen this apocalyptic wildfires uh, picture of toxic smog uh, over a whole chunk of uh, the, the, the U.S. Uh, West Coast. I mean, and then this guy wearing a mask juxtaposes that this pandemic and the climate crisis that are coming our way are not far apart, right? It's all happening right now as we speak. So even as we deal with this pandemic, we'll have to worry about how we're gonna prevent or avert the next big crisis that might come our way. And I would like to uh, think that the pandemic is testing us. Test when I say us, I mean humanity. Can we get together as planet and deal with the crisis? And if the answer is uh, we're not quite unified right now, then you have to ask whether we will be unified later when a bigger crisis comes our way. So um, that's the that's the you know critical question in my mind. Uh, how can we scale mountains with the same old colonial inequitable systems that we see all around us? And I I I want to end with some optimism, and partly why I agreed to speak with you is that because this is a conference for young people and students. And I think what is really missing in the global health and development space right now, or indeed global governance space right now, is uh, young people are missing, women are missing, and diversity is missing. And I think young people are absolutely fundamental. And I deliberately picked these pictures so that you can see what I'm trying to get at. I mean, Greta Thunberg and Malala, to me, are examples of young people who are able to see far ahead than what adults, our political leaders are able to see. I think adults have completely failed us in this pandemic. Adults are failing us in, in anticipating the climate crisis. They're in fact denying it as we speak. Adults in countries like America have 
100% failed young people on gun control. They've allowed young children to get slaughtered in schools so that the young school students have had to take a leadership role in gun control because adults are simply not coming to help them. And for the climate march that we had in Montreal, uh, I, I mostly saw young people on the streets, including my own 12 year old daughter who was on the streets. Young people are able to see with great clarity that the older men are simply not able to see. They're not able to see beyond the next election. They're not able to see beyond their individual greed on, on accumulating and retaining power. So if we want to reform this mess that we are in, I think there is simply no choice but to have young people in greater and greater leadership role, women in leadership role. I think by now we have seen that women have done a much better job of leading in this pandemic. Today, I was thrilled to see Jacinda Ardern, uh, the New Zealand Prime Minister, getting re-elected. Every country needs and deserves a Jacinda Ardern, in my opinion. And having women in leadership role and young people in leadership role is one way to counter the devastating path that the older men are taking us towards and find a way to rebalance the world and, and have um, challenge some of the, um, their slavish uh, attachment to money rather than putting uh, well-being ahead of uh, uh, just accumulating wealth. So my last slide is as a young person, each of you who's interested in global health, if, I, if you ask me, how can we help? Then I would offer you these suggestions. Uh, become a global citizen. Every chance you get, advocate uh, for a broader global solidarity. Practice global solidarity and allyship. Uh, develop a global state of mind. There is a beautiful article by uh, former Prime Minister, um, Health Minister Jane Philpott. She says the best law reason to learn about global health is to develop a global state of mind. We may not be able to be there everywhere or solve every problem, but we can certainly develop a global state of mind. Engage globally and locally to address inequities. So if there are inequities within Canada, uh, be unafraid to get engaged with that, whether that is refugee work, immigrant health work, indigenous health work, anything that you see as inequities internally, that is also global health. That is also worthy of our time and attention. Vote for good leaders. How important is the US election that's coming up next month? It is critical for the entire world. The minute you hit an age where you can vote, you should be out there voting for good candidates because we learned by now one bad candidate can unravel decades worth of progress, right? Um, and then call out bullshit. I've seen myself and my own students, they're completely unafraid of calling out BS that they see around us. And that has a very valuable, um, valuable contribution. Uh, young people are not intimidated. Young people have nothing to lose. Young people are not beholden to anyone. They are able to see with great clarity and they're able to call out bullshit. So what Greta Thunberg did at the United Nations was to call out the bullshit of the older adult men who are simply not doing anything. I think that, I think, is a very valuable contribution uh, in global health. Thank you very much, and I'm very happy to take your questions. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Pai, for such an amazing presentation. I think really ties into power and privilege, especially in our post-pandemic world. So um, with that, I'll open the floor to questions. And I see that we already have a lot of questions coming in. So I'll read it out for you, Dr. Pai. Um, here's the first one. So you mentioned that you have seen global health from different perspectives, from your education in India to your current position in Canada. How do you navigate these different identities of being from a country in the global south and working in the global north? And what advice do you have to others navigating these identities and how can we use them to advocate for a more equitable and intersectional global health? Um, great question. Um, thank you, Marilyn. Um, so most, many of my students, for example, here at McGill, they do their uh, thesis research in India. Well, I try very hard to tell them that they're not gonna do uh, parachute research, that they're just not gonna walk in and walk out of the data. I'm very thoughtful about how we do things in the group. 
um, uh, I also are uh, I make sure that my partner in India, the partner institution we work with in India, get equal credit. For example, if my student is a first starter because it is her uh, master's or PhD thesis, then the senior authorship goes to the Indian partner. In other words, I have ceded my place uh, as a senior author and made sure that we are equally sharing of credit. Number two, we try very hard to go with what our partners in India think a lot about what the problems and solutions should be. We try very hard not to impose. Um, I think my students uh, are taught to go to the field with great humility, that they're not there to solve uh, the problem, that they should not get into things that they don't understand. And there are many projects that we have done where we have not even been authors. We have just played a supportive role and we made it not about us, but there is a bigger cause to which we are contributing. And I'm lucky that I have a wonderful set of students and staff who share that vision. And I think having that vision within a group really helps. So in other words, we are very comfortable in seeing ourselves as allies. We don't see ourselves as leaders in every aspect of global health. We are willing to give up our spot. Amazing. Thank you, Dr. Pai. The second question is, how can the colonial trends be changed? Again, um, this, is not a, uh, this is not an easy question. It is not like flipping a switch uh, and, and, and changing colonial trends, because it, at some level, this is not even about global health. It's about asking why the world is so imbalanced in every aspect of global, in, the, in the world. If eight white men between them have as much wealth as 50% of humanity, how, how did that come to pass? How is the world okay with this? Why are they not pay, paying their fair share of taxes? That is the fundamental type of questions that we should be asking. So if you haven't, please, please, please read this incredible book called Winner, Winner Takes All by Anand Giridharadas. Incredible book where he says, rich people, the richest, the super rich should just pay their taxes and that's about all they need to do. We don't need them to become philanthropists throwing scraps as philanthropy, but after making such a ridiculous amount of wealth is not how the world should go. So we should work towards a future where there will be no need for philanthropies, where the rich and the super rich just pay their taxes. And if they did so, the calculations show there's enough left over for the entire planet to have universal health coverage. There's millions of things that we could do with that kind of money. And I think this US elections, this is front and center, right? The, the tax on the wealthy has come on the agenda at Davos and other places because it challenges the fundamental inequities and in wealth generation. To me, we cannot just say change global health when the underlying wealth inequities are so dramatic in this world. So it requires a political change and requires us to rethink how democracies function so that a fair share of taxes is what we should be all demanding for and holding people accountable, not their good intention, charitable efforts. Thank you, that was great. Um, the third question is how can our generation of medical students in Canada work to dismantle medical racism in older generations of medical profession professionals in the system? Um, first, uh, read, read, uh, spend time with indigenous folks who have spent a lot of time thinking about it. There's some incredible talks and webinars out there. I have attended a few as well. Understand Canada's colonial history. Um, I'm a little disappointed and alarmed that many Canadian, I did not grow up in Canada and I did not do my high school or my undergraduate here. I'm more than uh, upset that there isn't a good course on the colonial history offered to us. And I would love to ask all of you on the call, how many of you have really had a good one-on-one uh, -on -one course on the colonial history of Canada, either in high school or in college? And if that is not happening, that's a massive lapse in my opinion. You cannot be in Canada and not have that deep understanding of how devastating the colonial history has been 
and its relevance to what we see today. It's a direct hangover uh, that continues. Secondly, look at our abysmal diversity in Canadian universities. My school of population and global health here at McGill, and McGill is the oldest medical school in all of Canada for Christ's sakes. We have zero indigenous professors. We have zero black professors, right? So how on earth do we even expose our students and how on earth will we attract indigenous students when there is zero role models for them? Who do they see when they walk into a classroom? They see white professors teaching medicine or public health. We have failed and we failed miserably to uh, improve diversity in our schools of medicine, schools of public health. And therefore, we have this crazy problem because there are no indigenous professors, there are no indigenous students. Because there are no indigenous students, there will never be indigenous professors in future. It's like we are stuck in this eternal loop. To break this would require a dramatic rethink of how we've been doing business. So we must absolutely listen to indigenous folks who've been telling us for years on how messed up the situation is and take their advice on how to dismantle this because white people with all their good intentions have worsened the problems in many situations. So the humility you need in order to not impose your views and listen to indigenous people when they say this is a problem is a fundamental part of that learning. So uh, quick, a quick way of thinking about it is work on it at your level, then the, the awakening, the decolonizing of your own mind, my mind, and then work on reforming our institutions. So somebody like me needs to do both. So next month, my own team is having an entire workshop for just ourselves on anti-oppression, anti-racism and privilege, right? I've invited two people to do and teach my group. So we are as a team wanting to learn, but is that enough? No, I have to then advocate with my university to increase diversity to have indigenous professors, to have people of color. And when I reach a position of power, I need to model that and make sure I increase diversity. So it's a, it begins with an individual, but it has to end with the institution. Thank you, Dr. Pai. Um, the next question, how can you effectively tackle global health power structures in place when building your career as an immigrant coming from a privileged background? Um, terrific question, one that I struggle with every day. I really don't have a great answer to this because at some level, as an immigrant, I'm able to see some problems better than I may have seen if I were a, a white Canadian who was born here. And therefore, I can use that uh, voice to call out things. As a person of color, I can call out some things better than I can if I did otherwise. Um, and I can have policies in place if I reach a leadership role, for example, uh, not to, uh, to uh, brag or blow my own horn. When I was a director of global health, we tried very hard to make sure our uh, training programs here at McGill had a very strong presence of people from low and middle income countries. We invited them to be faculty. We paid for them to come. We wanted to increase diversity. We gave tons of fee waivers for folks from low and middle income countries. That was a conscious, thoughtful decision that I made. And along the same lines, if I were to reach a more important position of power, then I can say, I want to cede my spot to someone who is deserving and who is come from an underprivileged background. And I, I, and I use my voice as a professor to write and write and speak. And, and, and it may have some impact in convincing people that things need to change. Um, so I think those are some of the few examples that I can give you. But um, fundamentally, I think I'm also an equal part or a victim of the system that I am in. I'm still judged by my first authored publication on my grants that I hold. And it's, there is no place in my CV to, to display or talk about my allyship role. It's all about me, my students, my grants. Uh, and what I have done, and it's very hard to buck the trend. So that's why systemic change is needed so that global health practitioners or researchers who do more allyship work also get credit that they're not just judged or promoted on the basis of first authorship, so on and so forth. 
Thank you. Um, the next question is, could you share some thoughts about how we can collectively soften the blow of the impending recession? The overall wealth hasn't shrunk, but the wealth or misdistribution seems to have been deepened by the pandemic. The outrageously rich keep getting richer and people in low paying jobs are being hit the hardest. Where do we target and what role should the government play? Thank you for a very honest and important talk. What a fantastic question. Um, right now, as the world is spiraling into an economic chaos, just these eight rich white men could pretty much bail out the whole world by giving away a tiny fraction of their wealth, right? If the Amazons and the Microsofts and the Googles and the Facebook CEO decided that they want to contribute, tomorrow we could get out of this recession, but they won't, right? Because they have fundamentally benefited from the inequitable system that have allowed them to accumulate as much wealth as the 50% of the remaining uh, humanity. So um, one way governments could do them is to tax them, which is exactly what might happen if Joe Biden and Kamala Harris were to come into power. Just tax them straight off the bat, boom, you have brought billions of dollars into the government system that can be then distributed. Um, how do we prevent such accumulation of wealth in future will require us to rethink. Um, there are people who, uh, you know, all, all of you remember that famous uh, video clip from Davos, um, uh, where uh, this guy said, this guy said, you know, nobody here is even talking about taxation, right? Uh, and, 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 and it's like people have just don't want to go there, the rich people. And, and we also have to point out, that's why books like Anand Giridhar Das are so critical in, in rethinking how wealth got created and how it needs to be distributed. Um, secondly, as bad as the economic devastation is in the highest income countries here in Canada, we still have much deeper pockets than low and middle income countries, right? Think about it like this. If you are a billionaire and your wealth shrank by say 50%, you still left with 500 million in your bank account, right? You could still live really well with that money. So we are starting off with a very high level of wealth even if we lost a big chunk of it in this economic collapse, we will still have way more than what we actually need that we can and should. So we should not renege on our contribution to global development assistance. We should not pull back from all the good causes we've been funding and supporting. And we certainly should not uh, withdraw from global solidarity. Thank you, Dr. Pai. Um, I think we only have time for one more question. So um, I'll read it out and hopefully um, we can correspond with Dr. Pai and other questions after the sessions. So um, great discussion thus far. How do we solve racism and discrimination in global health if only non-white people can speak for issues that affect BIPOC folks? Ideally, everyone should be involved in the positive future for global health because if only these people recognize racism, how then do we create a better world for global health? Were you I'm struggling to understand exactly what that question is. So, so I think the representation at the table when global health decisions are made should involve those who are most impacted by that particular issue, right? For example, um, if that global health agency is committed to women's health in low and middle income countries, then women in low and middle income countries must play a huge role in shaping what their agenda is, how the money gets spent, so on and so forth. Um, if the, if the Global Health Agency is about HIV in uh, gay people, then gay people need to be in a leadership role in that particular organization to drive it forward. I think that is what I'm trying to say. Right now, it's mostly white people in high income countries across the board, across all organizations. That is dangerous because they come with their privileged white view of what can and cannot work, what should be done, should not be done, which may not at all resonate with what the realities of the ground are or what the most impacted people are thinking about uh, in terms of solutions. 
um, a nice way of thinking about it is whoever is closest to the problem is generally closest to the solution. And if I'm parachuting in from a long distance and I don't actually have lived experience of whatever it is that the problem that the agency is looking at, then my solutions are likely to be dangerously naive or worse, actually harmful. That was great. Thank you so much, Dr. We still have uh, two minutes to go before one. Okay, so we can do one more question. Um, so the next question would be, do you think participatory approaches such as participatory action research have the potential to reduce inequalities between global health researchers from high and low middle income countries? So um, uh, the answer is absolutely yes. It's better than you and I sitting in Montreal or Ottawa deciding um, how a, a women's health program in Rwanda should be run. So then you say, okay, I will go sit with the women in Rwanda. I will use participatory approaches and I will design the strategy, which I think is better than, uh, you know, white people in Ottawa deciding what needs to get done. But it's still a step below Rwandan women deciding what the agenda should be for that action project and them controlling the money in a way that benefits their and, and is deeply rooted in their realities. So that takes a whole another level beyond participatory approaches. Here, we have to reach a level of staging saying, you folks decide what the problem is, what the solution is, how are you gonna spend the money? Our job is to support as allies from the outside. We are not actually getting involved in how you run the project or what you think is relevant. That requires seeding of power, which I think I would argue we are not taught to do, doesn't come naturally to us, and it'll take an enormous effort to go along uh, that direction. Thank you, Dr. Pai. So I believe that's all the time that we have for Dr. Pai's session. Thank you everyone for your questions. I see so many have filled up the question bank and thank you most of all, Dr. Pai for taking the time today to share your research with us and giving us such an engaging and interesting presentation today. So- wow, So many good questions. I wish I could just stay and answer some of them. <laughs> Well, I'm happy to do that if anyone wants to stay on. Uh, but if you want to, if you have some other session, that's fine too. Yeah, so um, for according to our program, we will now be transitioning into a lunch break just before our careers panel in the next hour. So um, thank you all to our attendees and feel free to continue to network. You can also use our Facebook group during the lunch hour to network with other um, individuals. Um, other than that, that is the end of this session. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Here's what I promised to do. I will just stay on and I will answer the questions on the um, uh, Q&A box, okay? At least brief answers so that you will have them when you come back from lunch. Does that seem okay? Sounds good. Thanks, Dr. Pai. Thank you, Sakshi. Thanks, everyone. Have a good one. Have a great rest of the conference. <laughs>